Today, we are talking about the issue of preventing infection and the principles of managing outbreaks in care homes, especially COVID-19. Our guest is Professor Jenny Wilson, Professor of Healthcare Epidemiology at the University of West London and also Vice President of the Infection Prevention Society. And thank you to Medipal for providing the educational grant that made this video possible. Welcome, Professor Wilson. Last week, the Infection Prevention Society published guidance for the management of COVID-19 in care homes. What are the unique problems that care homes face compared to hospitals and other NHS organisations? Yes, well, that's a good question. And really, the biggest problem is that care homes are full of highly vulnerable people. So the sort of people that in the community we would be shielding, but they're living together within a care home setting and it is their own home. It's not a hospital. And so we need to adapt the infection control precautions we might use in acute care to this, this residential setting. Thank you. Could you briefly remind our viewers about how COVID-19 is spread? Yes. So um, we know that COVID-19 is, is fairly transmissible virus, but it's spread largely from droplets that we cough out of our respiratory tract if we have the infection. Um, so in coughing or sneezing or even talking, um, those droplets don't travel that far. They travel up to a, around about a metre. Um, but if they land on another person's mucous membrane, so that means their nose, their eyes or their mouth, then it can infect that second person. Or alternatively, of course, we commonly touch our face and our, our nose and our mouth with our hands and we then will pick up virus in those respiratory secretions and then transfer it either directly to another mucous membrane or indirectly via surfaces that we may touch and transfer that virus to. Great, thank you very much. What signs should we look for in elderly residents and older people and what should we do if we think someone has COVID-19? Yes, so it's important to detect the possible signs of, of uh, a person who, who has a COVID-19 infection as early as possible. And that's particularly the case in a, uh, an elderly care residential setting where clearly you need to implement precautions to try and prevent transmission to the other vulnerable residents as soon as possible. So whilst we're very familiar with the idea that COVID-19 infections generally present with a cough and a fever, you, those signs and symptoms are very common in people who, who develop COVID-19, but there's also other signs that you need to be alert to. So simple signs of an upper respiratory tract infection, such as a runny nose or a blocked nose, headache, sore throat, or hoarseness, loss of voice. And any of those signs should really be acted on as soon as possible. So if you, even if you don't know that the, it's definitely COVID-19, if any resident develops any signs or symptoms that are indicative of an upper respiratory tract infection, you need to assume that it may be COVID-19 and take the appropriate precautions. Um, so that would mean um, trying to limit who enters the room to look after that particular resident, wearing personal protective equipment for their care and, and making sure really importantly that you wash hands before and after putting on that PPE. And then the other thing to do um, now that testing is more widely available is to take steps to arrange for that resident to be tested for COVID-19. They may have another a viral infection, but it's really important to get that test done and establish quickly um, whether they are infected with COVID-19. Moving on to the next question, what precautions should we be taking to protect vulnerable residents from COVID-19? Yes, so obviously when you identify a, a, a resident has the infection, then we, we clearly need to, to isolate that resident in their own room, so discourage them from leaving the room. Um, and ideally, it's much better if they have um, their own toilet and shower facilities so that you can contain them within that, that room. But obviously, there are many other residents who live, as I say, in what is their own home. And so we need to take precautions to try and limit the risk that those individuals will acquire COVID-19. And of course, 
they may acquire either from other residents, but also more importantly, from the staff who they're in daily contact with who are providing the care. So what we need to think about is the social distancing that we are asked to adhere to in, in the way that we are living in this country at the moment. So try and ensure that you keep residents and staff two metres apart from each other so those droplets can't land on somebody else's mucous membranes. So try and do that as much as possible. Clearly, it, there's many occasions where it's not possible, but try and create an environment where that happens. Limit visiting wherever possible, so no unnecessary visits that may bring the virus in. And then encourage residents to wash their hands after they've coughed, after they've sneezed, before meals, after snacks. Encourage staff to wash their hands after resident contact. Um, between any tasks and absolutely after they may have touched their own mouth or nose. We need to be really aware that that we will transfer this virus on our hands. So hand hygiene is really important. And then it may be necessary for staff to wear just a waterproof surgical mask if they're in close contact, so within two metres of residence, um, just to avoid those droplets getting um, anywhere near those vulnerable residents. But it's really important not to touch that mask with your hands because, again, you may pick up virus and transfer it. Um, and if you're wearing gloves or aprons, again, really important to use them once for one resident and then discard them and wash your hands after that episode of care. Thank you. And linked to the previous question, what is high level PPE? And is this ever required in care homes? Yeah, so um, often this is talked about, particularly in ITUs and acute care settings. And there are certain procedures um, that may be performed on patients, which involve a sort of deeper part of the respiratory tract and when that happens in certain circumstances, you can get tiny little particles released from the respiratory tracts, which can float around in the air. Um, and obviously, it, because they are lighter and they, they float around for a little bit longer, the risk then is that the staff may inhale those particles and so they land deeper in their respiratory tract and may then go on and cause um, COVID-19 in that staff member. Now. Obviously, those types of procedures predominantly occur in acute care setting, but the main one that you may find happens in a, in a residential care setting where you've got particularly frail or particularly sick residents is suctioning of the airway. So in that circumstances, if you're involved in, in suctioning a resident's airway, then you need to wear a special mask called an FFP3. And all that does is it just filters much more reliably those tiny little particles and prevents you from inhaling them. Um, so it's very high filtration level mask and it has to be fitted very closely to the face to ensure that the particles can't get in around the side of the mask. And then wear a gown as well to avoid anything splashing on you during those sorts of procedures where, where there is that additional risk. Thank you. The Infection Prevention Society guidance gives advice on facilitating relatives' visits when a resident with COVID-19 is at the end of their life. Could you summarise this, please? Yeah, so it's so important that relatives are allowed to, to visit and say goodbye to their loved ones. Um, this is just so, so important. And whilst we are really concerned about preventing transmission of the virus, there's actually no reason why relatives can't come and, and be with their loved one when they, when they are dying, provided they are advised how to take the, the sort of standard infection control precautions that you would be taking. So um, wearing a surgical mask, perhaps covering their clothing with a plastic apron. And actually, provided they are instructed to carefully wash their hands on leaving the room and before they touch their own mucous membranes, they can also hold their relative's hand because that skin to skin contact is so important um, when, when people are, are dying. And I think uh, all homes need to try and facilitate those final moments to be um, as peaceful and, and involving the relatives as closely as possible, obviously within limits. So it's sensible to limit the number of, of relatives that are allowed to come, but it's really important that, that they are able to be there. And finally, what is your takeaway message for care home staff? So I think the really important message is that 
the infection control principles that need to be applied to control this virus are actually quite simple. Um, it's about social distancing, so trying to ensure that we keep um, separation between residents and staff to minimise the risk of those droplets transferring. Um, but then just using gloves and aprons appropriately, making sure that we change them between tasks, between residents, and that we always wash our hands and avoid contact with any mucous membranes ourselves so that we protect ourselves uh, after contact with residents who may be uh, carrying the virus. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Wilson. We've come to the end of today's talk. Thank you once again for your time and expertise and to Medipal for their educational grant.